Okay. Okay. Thank everyone for coming. You are second and last speaker of the term. Um, today we're joined by Professor Oliver Harris from Leicester. Um, he um, is focusing on archaeological theory, especially post-humanism and the ontological turn, um, specifically focusing in the Bronze Age and Neolithic Europe on material culture and the body and gender. So I'd like to start. Thanks very much. Thanks very much for the invitation. Um, when I was contacted, uh, the kind of invitation said, we're very interested in your work on uh, new materialism and archaeological theory. Well, in 50 minutes, you may regret uh, that particular choice of words and wish you'd ask for Viking boat burials or gender or various other things I do that might be more crowd pleasing. But, you know, never say no to a nice invitation to talk about your favourite subject, however much people might come to regret it very, very shortly. Um, so my talk today is going to be divided into three parts. I'm going to start off by talking about kind of the current state of archaeological theory, and I'm going to try and think about how we often write and talk about the kind of uh, shape of archaeological thought, how we teach it and how we conceptualize it. And in, as part of rethinking that kind of um, history of archaeological thought, I'm going to touch on the apparent eclecticism present in archaeological theory today. And there are lots of terms and turns and phrases and notions that you might have come across in lectures or in your reading, many of which are obscure and confusing. And I'm not gonna try and explain all of them, but if you wanna ask any questions about that at the end, I'm very happy to uh, kind of offer definitions, at least my own personal definitions of how these different things work. But my aim really will be rather than trying to kind of explain all of this, just to kind of look at the overall shape of the discipline and think about how that relates to the kind of broader stories of the history of archaeological thought that we tell ourselves tell ourselves and that's going to be in pretty broad brush strokes obviously so you can have a go at me about the absence of nuance uh, in the questions afterwards or over a glass of wine later when Simon will be making sure we don't get drunk and insult each other or say anything too vicious especially to me as your as your honored guest um in the second part then I'm going to try and think about why despite the eclecticism and also the kind of way in which contemporary archaeological theory sometimes seems to repeat concerns of yesteryear, why archaeological theory still matters today. And I'm going to try and expound in the middle part of the talk why I think that it's really important for our contemporary archaeological questions that we continue to think theoretically, and why it's really essential that we learn about archaeological theory and that we practice archaeological theory. So part two is going to be why, despite the kind of eclectic despite the kind of return of seemingly familiar ideas, archaeological theory really still matters to the work we do as archaeologists in the present. And in the last part, I'm going to talk about why archaeological theory and archaeology generally matters on a bigger scale. I'm going to think about how in a world of contemporary crises, why it's still a reasonable use of your time, at least I like to think so, justifying my own existence, to think the kind of esoteric thoughts that archaeological theory generates. So I'm going to think about in that last part, why archaeological theory not only matters for today, but it matters for tomorrow as well. So that's the sort of three parts to my talk that uh, we're going to talk about for the next, I don't know, however long until I get dragged off the stage kicking and screaming, or I storm out insisting on a glass of wine, depending which, which one happens first. So part one, I'm calling it Paradigm Lost, uh, stealing that title from a recent article by Gavin Lucas and Chris Whitmore. And I will think a little bit about the history and in some, to some extent the eclecticism of contemporary archaeological theory. So if you were to come along to a standard, I'm sure it came ever more sophisticated than this, but in many universities, the history of archaeological theory is kind of taught like this. There was a period of culture history where people divided the world up into past cultures, where they looked at pattern, recurring patterns of houses and pots and burials and said, ah, oh, yes, that's a particular culture, the beaker folk, whoever else it might be, uh, the rhinoclacton folk, the linear bands ceramic, whatever else you might want to define. Uh, and then that was critiqued by people like Lewis Binford and Colin Renfrew and David Clark and many others uh, in the 1960s and 70s and was replaced by the ever more scientific and rigorous and positivist processual archaeology. And alongside that came all of the many uh, 
uh, ramifications for how we approach archaeological specialisms, uh, 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 fancy for hypothesis testing, all those kinds of things. And then in the 1980s, in these very halls, Ian Hodder said, no, enough with that, and threw out the gods of processual archaeology onto the courtyard of the McDonald's, and they lay strewn about everywhere, and he walked into the Haddon Library and burnt every copy of uh, Renfrew's books. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but only slightly, I'm sure Simon will confirm. Uh, <laughs> there were uh, there were great debates and those sorts of things. But the crucial thing was that in place of an archaeology, which was um, primarily focused around hypothesis testing, um, positivism and a kind of version of archaeology as science, a concern with meaning and with agency and with power came back to the fore again, beginning in the 1980s. And of course, also alongside that, the critical work of feminist archaeologists turning gender into a critical issue for archaeologists to explore from the early 1980s work of Meg Conkey uh, and Joan Gero and Janet Spector through Mary Louise Sorensen's work in this department and many others coming together and adding that critical element to post-processual thought. And so if you fast forward to the early 2000s, when I was an undergraduate, I remember going on a trip to Stonehenge with my uh, then professor, Mike Parker Pearson. And he said, oh, it's really strange. We've had these three great turns of archaeological theory, culture history, processual archaeology and post-processualism. And the next big thing, that'll be up to your generation. You're going to have to come up with the next big thing. And so... You know, we're still kind of waiting in some ways for the next big thing to come along. There's a whole host of people competing to be this next big thing, but we perhaps haven't seen another kind of what we might think of as a paradigm shift in the same kind of way. Now, if you spend more than 35 seconds thinking about archaeology, the kind of simplicity and the falsehood of this story will become immediately apparent to you. And so rather than this kind of theories of successive paradigms, we might be better off thinking of much more overlapping paradigms. Most people around the world today still operate primarily in a culture historic mode. And in fact, anytime you speak to anybody excavating a Bronze Age site around uh, Cambridge, you go to CAU and you talk to them and they say, oh, we've got a beaker burial over here. It doesn't matter if they're the most post-processual archaeologists in the world. They're still using ideas that have emerged from culture history. So it isn't the case at all that these paradigms have kind of replaced one that came before it. Rather more, we've sort of seen an additive model where new ideas have been bolted onto archaeology. We've had other ways of thinking kind of incorporated into, into this way of thinking. And of course, this can also capture how many of the kind of ideas that crop up in one phase might have been prefigured in another to evoke another Cambridge archaeologist, Graham Clark's work, primarily under a cultural historical model, evoked critical ideas of ecology in his work on Starkar, the great Mesolithic site, that might more easily be placed into a processual model. So the boundaries themselves don't really work in any kind of neat way. So that kind of very simplistic, one paradigm, then the other, then the other, doesn't really work. And instead, we might, if we want, think about this kind of um, sequential series, although, and again, then this next big thing being bolted on there. Now, to some extent, this might um, explain some of the kind of eclecticism of today's world, but perhaps this even makes today's eclecticism even more striking. We don't have this kind of next easy paradigm, what I refer to as the next big thing, actually seems to be a competing morass of lots of different ideas in archaeological theory. And this is the slide. If you want to come back and ask me what any of these terms mean or who does them or what they are, then we can have a like quiz section at the end where I give you my best 30 second definition of any of these different kinds of approaches. Now, obviously, I'm more sympathetic to some of these than others, um, but nonetheless, these are all kind of arguing for a space in the contemporary archaeological uh, set of arguments about what's going on and where we should be going and what the direction of travel ought to be. So if before, even if they were kind of joining on with each other, there was a clear sense of what was happening. Now we seem to have this kind of um, uh, kind of much more complicated in some ways, seeming sets of options with different isms and ideas kind of coming in and in and out of vogue at different moments and some people would group these in different kinds of ways and there's big arguments you know is new materialism a banner for lots of these different things or is it a specific version we again those are things we can talk about later about what i happen to think about that's not important for my argument at this stage 
And you add into that then that not only do we have this big eclecticism of ideas, but older ideas seem to be coming back and re-emerging in particular kinds of ways. So, for example, if you were to go and read some of the big accounts of the movement of people through Europe driven by ancient DNA studies, they might seem rather familiar to you if you're aware of the kind of way in which historians wrote about this narrative. So we have stories of the Yamnaya folk sweeping off the uh, uh, in Eastern European plains and, but, and a great sway the popular population replacement and so on. That was the big argument in Britain for the arrival of the Beta Folk, published in 2018 by Olaudi et We saw population replacement taking, taking place in this kind of way. Now, it's quite commonplace to kind of critique these, these ADNA studies from the kind of, uh, from the perspective of uh, people like me uh, and have written about why they might be quite problematic. But I think it's really what I concentrate here is how interesting it is to see these older ideas coming back. And even I think it's fair to say when we have smaller scale ancient DNA studies, we still see surprisingly familiar narratives coming back in. So, I mean, uh, there's a brilliant article in lots of ways on the uh, ancient DNA at a particular Neolithic, Neolithic British tomb called Hazlitt and North in Oxfordshire that was published by Chris Fowler and others. And these are people with enormously brilliant, theoretical, sophisticated minds. But when you go and look at the models of kinship that are revealed by their ADNA, they're surprisingly familiar with big patriarchal figures playing absolutely critical roles. So for all this theory, then, are we really getting new ideas here or are all the same things just coming around? Is science just revealing the same things happening again and again? And in fact, as archaeologists have written more and more about time, this might be unsurprising to us. If time isn't some linear straight line, but is a complex, non-linear, percolating, circulating, chaotic thing that comes and goes and ebbs and flows, as archaeologists like uh, Chris Whitmore have written about, then we shouldn't really expect some sort of linear story of archaeological ideas. And in fact, a number of archaeologists have written over the years about how um, new theoretical ideas always seem to bring with them something of the old. If you go and look at the first publications on post-processual archaeology in Hodder's introduction, for example, Symbolic and Structural Archaeology, published in 1982, in that book, he deliberately evokes culture history. He talks about the importance of Stuart Pigger's work, the attention to particularism and to specific histories that he evokes a need to return to that world. If you go and read early sort of Lewis Binford's early work, it's really strikingly similar in part to some of the things that new materialists write about the world, about the capacities and properties of objects and materials, for example. Matthew Johnson has written about how phenomenology, the particular approach very popular in parts of British landscape archaeology in the 1990s and 2000s, he argues, was a kind of reinvented version of English romanticism, of people liking to go and spend out time outdoors and going for long walks. He's responding specifically to archaeologists like Chris Tilley, who published a book in the middle of the 1990s called The Phenomenology of Landscape, in which Tilley argued it was by going and visiting monuments in the field and using your own body as a proxy for past people that you could come to understand the world in particular kinds of ways. Now, um, and for Matthew Johnson, this is a kind of critique of phenomenology. That it's just this kind of reheated empiricism, uh, uh, English romanticism, rather. So in this sense, we can think of rather than either my initial linear model or even the overlapping model, we've got something much more complicated where these ideas seem to come back and back and back round again. And I've referred to this as the kind of model of the eternal return, drawing on the uh, notion from Greek philosophy and the Stoics that time is always going to repeat itself, that the same conditions will return time and again. Of course, this was particularly picked up by the 19th century German philosopher uh, Nietzsche, and I won't go into any depths about that today, but there's a different way here of thinking about time. So if all these ideas are just coming back round and round again, and if we don't really have a kind of model of a paradigm shift of one thing replacing the other, if we don't have then a sense really of progress in archaeological thought that we're somehow getting closer to a better model or a better way of understanding the past, what's, in the end, what's new about any of this? Does theory even matter at all then? 
Is it just going to be history repeating itself over and over again? And we can kind of put that aside and just worry about the techniques that we want to use and the approaches we want to use and forget about this kind of highfalutin theoretical jargon with its multitude of eclectic terms that require 17 dictionaries to follow along or a lifetime of rather sad, lonely dedication as I've spent to kind of follow all of them in different kinds of ways. Well, obviously, I don't think that. I'd be very, very depressed if I did, because it would mean I was wasting a lot of my time. So I'm going to argue that despite this return, I'm not going to deny the nature of the turning of these ideas. I'm not going to try and pretend there's a sequential set of paradigms replacing each other. I think it is complicated. It is multiple. It is, in some senses, non-linear. I still think there's a lot we need archaeological theory for. And that's what I want to turn to in the second part of my talk then. Having argued that archaeological theory isn't following this journey of straightforward paradigm shifts, that it does embrace a sense in which ideas come back and return again, I'm still going to suggest it matters. And the reason it matters fundamentally is that repetition isn't necessarily bad. We tend to think of repetition as being boring or repeat. Oh, it's just the same old arguments again and again. I've heard this a thousand times before. If you go to the Theoretical Archaeology Group conference, you'll hear old lags saying, oh, another session on memory, another session on deposition. I've seen all these things before. It's, we don't, why are we doing it again? But I want to suggest, actually, that repetition isn't about just repeat, or isn't necessarily, I should say, just about repeating the same thing over and over again. Instead, it could be a moment when differences come to the fore. And here I think we can um, think about some of the kind of examples I drew on earlier to think that through. So in many ways, post-processionalism repeated some of the ideas that were at the heart of culture history, about specific narratives, about historical specificity. But of course, post-processional archaeology wasn't just um, uh, culture history repeating. It brought in lots of other concerns, for example, with gender and power that weren't present in that original narrative. Similarly, new material is, isn't just systems theory reheated, as I once had someone describe one of my own talks, much to my personal offence. Um, I think it brings through all sorts of other kinds of important concerns with it. And I would disagree with Matthew Johnson that phenomenology is simply English romanticism repeated. I think there might be elements of it that are present in Tilly's accounts of walking the doors of Cursus. But I think if we tunnel into some of the more sophisticated engagements, say, by Julian Thomas in his 1996 book, Time, Culture and Identity, we can draw out other kinds of ways of thinking about people and landscape and people and things in that tradition of thought that are really challenging to English romanticism. So this repetition then does bring back things that are familiar or known to us, but it also brings with it different kinds of difference. One of the difficulties with talking about difference is you end up saying difference over and over again, which is a trick I need to master somehow. I need a lot more synonyms for difference than I have. But this repetition brings other things with it. And I think that is really, really important. So the question then with new um, archaeological theories or new concepts isn't so much are they completely new, if they come out of nowhere, are they different from everything we've ever seen before? Because the answer is they're not going to be. They're going to bring back ideas we're familiar with in some ways and not with others. The question is, does that theoretical approach allow you to say new things? Does it create a different way of talking about the past? Does it give you a vocabulary that allows you to describe it in new ways? And does it, as I would suggest is really important in a moment, critically allow you to ask new questions, to ask different questions of the past, not simply attempt to answer the questions that have already been handed down to us. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit now about the kind of approach I happen to deal uh, take, which is new materialism. But I want to stress here, and I'll mention this again in a bit, that I'm not advocating this particularly over any other set of approaches. I'm not attempting to say this is the only way to deal with contemporary archaeological questions. I'm not arguing that for a moment. But what I want to suggest is that this is an example of one of the ways of thinking that can help us ask new questions of old things, do so in a different way, and help show that although ideas are always coming back, they can that return with difference can help us understand the past in interesting new ways, can help us construct past worlds 
in interesting new ways. So here are four books on the screen that sometimes get associated with the term new materialism. I would argue that only two of these are actually new materialist. These two over here, I don't think either of those two are, but other people would disagree and that doesn't matter in terms of uh, my talk today. Uh, some of us who work at the University of Leicester are attempting to develop a particular take within new materialism. Here are books by myself and by two of my colleagues at Leicester who have attempted to um, uh, think about these ways of writing about the past. And we're all part of the Material Worlds uh, Research Centre, which is directed by myself and Rachel Crellin and Mariana Hemerickson, who is sitting in the audience uh, today. So we are working as part of this Material world Centre to try and think about the way in which archaeological theory and different kind of empirical approaches can allow us to ask new questions about the past. Our particular ways of approaching this are influenced variously by what we might think of as assemblage theory or new materialism, and particularly by certain kind of philosophers' work who are in that vein. Uh, Deleuze for myself and, and Ben, and, and particularly Rosie Bray Dotty for Rachel. But that work is kind of a part of a coherent attempt to find a way out of some kind of traditional archaeological questions and generate new ones. So what does that mean in practice then? I'm going to give you a couple of examples now about how archaeological theory can help us ask new questions of the past. And once I've done that, that will kind of bring to the close the second part of the talk and we can move to the, kind of the last section. So the first thing I want to talk about is some of the work that myself and Rachel uh, have done on a project that we directed uh, until quite recently called Beyond the Three-Age System, which was funded by uh, the Leverhulme Trust, working particularly with Christina Soraki uh, and Hugh Barton as well here. And we looked in this project at a whole host of different kinds of material culture from the Neolithic and Bronze Age of Britain, uh, particularly trying to use microware analysis to understand these objects. But from the start, what we wanted to do here was not just look at these objects uh, again with the kind of through microscopes with lots of newfangled techniques and look at them with scanning electron microscopes and micro XRFs and with metallographic microscopes and whatever else. It was also to try and ask new questions. And to do that, we embedded this work within new materials, within a set of approaches that ask us to attend to the material properties of the world, to think about how history is a product, not just of human beings, but of people and things together, and how the capacities and properties of things emerge differently in specific historical worlds. So, one of the objects we looked at were these stone bracelets, which you get in, uh, particularly in early Bronze Age burials in Britain. Um, they have traditionally been associated with uh, as wrist archers, wrist guards. Uh, the idea being that they're strapped to the inside of your wrists, you draw the bow and it protects the wrist from any damage. And they were first interpreted as that in the 19th century when they were first kind of recognized. And they've been subject to pretty intensive study ever since. We not only get them in Britain, we get them in Ireland, where they're not found in Greece, interestingly, we get them in Central Europe and in Spain, lots of different parts uh, of Europe at this time. So many hundreds of them are known in total. Um, now, really interesting reviews of these have found that sometimes they are found on the inside wrists of burials, but sometimes on the outside and sometimes nowhere near the body at all. Uh, and our work looked at uh, 15 examples in a great deal of detail and found no real evidence that any of them have ever been employed as wrist guards. There's no use where to suggest any of them have, have been used in that particular way, but they do all have lots of really, really interesting stories to tell. So here's one example. This is Tring from Hertfordshire, one of, particular, one of these objects, which is a really beautiful bracelet. So it's made out of uh, Langdale Sun. So those of you who know about the Neolithic in Britain will know that one of the people place, places people love to go and get polished stone axes was at the top of mountains in the Lake District. And they also go there to get this kind of material for making braces many, uh, quite a long time later, probably well over a thousand years after the axes stopped being made there. People go and start getting that material for braces, this beautiful green stone. In this case, we can use microware analysis to start mapping the relationship between this particular object and all the materials it came into contact with. So we can map how the four holes in the corners were drilled with a flint bow drill. So that's a, kind of a piece of technology that allows you to turn a piece of flint and make those holes through it in quite particular ways. We know they were done particularly one and two. We can tell the order of, not so much with these ones down here. We, map the order some of those holes took place in. 
We can look at how it was made brought into contact with different kinds of materials. This one, for example, was decorated with gold. And we can tell from the air by using uh, analysis through a scanning electron microscope that that's Bronze Age gold. It's not the gold of some unfortunate curator who had their wedding ring on and scratched it accidentally. We know that's gold that dates back to the Bronze Age through our work with Chris Standish there. We can also see what it's come into contact with other harder materials that have chipped it. It had copper studs in each of those four holes. So coming in, again, contact with other kinds of materials. So microanalysis begins by prompting us to think about, or rather new materialism, sorry, prompts us to think about the history of these materials coming into contact with each other, the histories of making in a detailed object like this. And you might say, well, that sounds quite familiar. That's a bit like an object biography, isn't it? That's kind of what you're talking about. And it certainly has uh, similarities with that kind of uh, narrative. But I think one of the things that new materialism allows us to do is to kind of escape from just telling object biographies, which are by definition kind of modeled on human life histories. They have a single linear direction with a beginning, a middle and an end. And they also focus in on particular objects in particular kinds of ways, noticeable objects like this particular one from Tring, for example. What new materialism does is allows us instead to tell stories that crisscross objects, that make us focus on stories that might traverse from one bracer to another, to another. So for example, in many examples that we looked at, the corners of bracers had been cut off, sometimes accidentally and sometimes deliberately. And that had happened at different points in their histories. And understanding that requires us not just to tell the biography of a single object, but to work between biographies in interesting kind of non-linear fashions, we can start interrogating these objects through that and asking them questions about almost their own memories, their own perspectives on the world that aren't just rooted in the stories of human beings. From this perspective, the kind of question that we've been asked so many times when we say we've been working on braces is people say, oh, what were braces really for? Or what really are braces? And I think those kinds of questions are actually not the right, or they're not the only questions we can ask of these objects. Those are questions that are driven by older kinds of theoretical concerns, maybe culture historical ones, what kinds of people first use braces, or processual ones, which might be, um, oh, are these associated with particular ranks, or what's the function of these objects, or post-processual ones, which are what do they mean, or what do they represent? It's not those questions are wrong or misleading, but like by turning to new materialism, we ask a different set of questions. And that's what I mean by theory acting, not just to kind of answer old questions in new ways, but to try and ask different kinds of questions. One more example of this, this comes from our work on the same project, looking at the burial of a gold worker at the Upton Lovell uh, burial in Wiltshire, one of the famous Wessex graves. One of the things new materialism asks us to do is to attend to the way in which particular properties of objects emerge in specific historical circumstances. So the property of stone or the property of bronze or the properties of gold are not the same throughout time and space determined by a kind of generic or essentialist or um, universal set of scientific properties. Instead, they emerge in particular historical contexts in particular ways not at the whim of people at all, but in a combination of people and things and history together. And our work looking at gold in this grave forms a really good example of this. Our work was able to show that lots of the objects in the grave, including these kind of unprepossessing stones, this anvil here, these old pieces of battle axe here, and this very, very intact battle axe right here, were used to work gold in the grave in particular, or not in the grave, potentially by the person who was buried in the grave, but certainly by someone, we used to work gold in particular kinds of ways. And the way they were working gold was treating that gold much more as though it were a kind of stone than it was that it was a kind of metal. So if you compare the way in which tin and copper and then bronze are treated in this period, the way it's made, the way it's smelted, the way it's worked, the way it's transformed, that's a very different way of treating that material than the way gold is being treated. Gold is being worked with stone and like a stone and applied to stone in different kinds of ways. So here we have an option where new materialism 
allows us to ask a new kind of question. The idea that stone, gold can be a kind of stone allows us to escape the taxonomies that we now impose from the present and ask other kinds of questions. It doesn't mean there are other older questions we could continue to ask, but there are new ways of engaging with this here, I think provoking new kinds of questions. So I think archeological theory remains really critical today because it's one of the few ways we have of continuing to shift our dominant patterns of thought, the kind of habits of thought that we all inherit, both from our childhood, but also through our education, through our, the way we're taught at university, we continue to inherit and engage and think through particular modes of thought. And I think that really thinking about the past, and by that I mean really thinking something new about the past, doesn't just require new answers, it requires new kinds of questions. I think it'd be really interesting to think about what ancient DNA might be telling us if we ask questions about gender from a very different perspective, or if we didn't try and explain, to simply use it to answer questions that we've had for a very long time. Again, I'm not trying to ask, argue that we should replace those old questions, but rather that archaeological theory can add new questions, and that those new questions will be the ones that give us new kinds of solutions. Braces were continually interpreted as archers' wrist guards. Even when you get brilliant articles that review all the evidence and basically say there's no real evidence for them being wrist guards, but they are, they have to be, they're still wrist guards. I mean, although so there was one really interesting one about how they might have been for raptors to land on people's arms, which is pretty cool. There's no use for evidence for that either, but there you go. But it's still a case of what we've got here is an opportunity to think new quests, think new thoughts and ask new questions. And that's why archaeological theory can remains really essential to what we do, even as it brings back older ideas and even as we move into a more eclectic and less paradigm -y model of the present. Now, as I started at the start, as I started saying at the beginning of this section, I'm not arguing at all that the specific theoretical approach you need to take to ask new questions is the same one that I happen to be following down. Theory is a toolbox, and depending on what it is you want to answer, what kind of questions you're interested in, different theoretical approaches will be appropriate for generating the problems that we can then seek to answer with different kinds of empirical techniques. So I'm absolutely not saying, oh, everybody should be a human theorist, or everyone should read these philosophers, or everyone should do the same thing that I'm doing. The point instead is to argue that what's critical is to have a theoretical engagement, to take an informed and critical theoretical position, to open up these new kind of questions, and then answer them with interesting new kinds of ways. And this absolutely isn't a critique of new techniques from ancient DNA to anything else. Here's a shot of my colleague Rachel Prelin and our postdoc Matt Hitchcock and our, one of our PhD students Hamish Dara and Rachel is teaching them uh, metal use swear analysis in this picture. And I'm a huge fan of this process, uh, Rachel's new project. Uh, on the history of bronze that I'm lucky enough to be part of. You can see what a huge fan I am taking a selfie of one of our other postdocs, David, looking at a, a hoard here that Cambridge Archaeological Unit had lent us. I think the point is not then in any way to argue against new empirical techniques or employing old empirical techniques. It's simply to argue that if we want to ask new questions of the past, and if we want to generate new answers, we have to do that within informed and critical theoretical approaches. Okay, so we've had two parts so far. The first part, I argued that um, the kind of paradigm model of archaeological theory doesn't really work, and that the kind of we also see this kind of return of ideas continually throughout the history of archaeological thought, which suggests a kind of non-linearity to the way archaeological ideas work. In the second part, I argued that. <laughs> That doesn't necessarily matter as long as we embrace the notion that new ideas help generate new problems, generate new questions that will allow us to get to different kinds of solutions when we engage them with our material. In the last part of the talk today, I want to think about a kind of bigger set of questions, which is kind of why any of this really matters at all. Why in the world where we find ourselves now, anyone really wants to care about archaeological theory or indeed archaeology, really. And I'm going to suggest that the discipline as a whole and archaeological theory in particular still matters. 
So we seem to be in a world today that's riven by crises of all sorts of kinds. We have, um, you know, climate crisis, we have wars, we have people attacking migrants, we have attacks on uh, LGBTQI plus people. We have all sorts of ways in which there seems to be increasing division and conflict and stress driven by a kind of existential threat to the future of humanity. Now, um, what I'm going to not, I am not going to suggest in the course of the next little bit that archaeology is going to solve these problems, far from it, but I am going to suggest that perhaps that archaeology can help in different kinds of ways. I think one of the critical things archaeology can contribute to as we move, as we work through these issues, as we think about these issues, is that Archaeology can help us conceptualize the kind of world we might be reaching towards or a world we might create. One of the failures, I think, of our ability to challenge the events that are happening in the world is that we haven't really managed to manage to imagine what a future might look like. Famously, and this is variously attributed to Frederick Jameson, but also to Mark Fisher, people say it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. And if we're going to imagine a world that's different, I think archaeology can provide us with those resources in a really powerful way. It can offer worlds that are different to the world we have today. It can offer us a way of creating a, ways of thinking about the world and ways of imagining world's past and therefore world's present and therefore world's future that aren't simply a repetition of the same, to go back to that comment, that offer us something different. And most importantly of all, it's not simply enough to abandon hope. It's not simply enough to throw our hands up and say, there's nothing we can do, there's nothing that we can uh, achieve with this, that we as archaeologists have nothing to offer this. As the great feminist philosopher Rosie Bardotti says, despair is not a project, affirmation is. We need to take the work that we're doing and find a way to make it useful, to find a way to make it contribute to the world that we're working in today. In this sense, then, I think we want to think about how archaeology can become what we uh, what has been termed elsewhere, uh, notably by Rachel Krellin, future-oriented. There are lots of ways in which archaeologists are already starting to do this in different kinds of ways. So the argument I'm going to put forward today is by far not the only people who are arguing that archaeology needs to be concerned and engaged with the future. There are kind of five, I think you can define five different um, approaches. So we can think about the kind of classic one is that we can learn from the past. So people will say, oh, we can learn from how past people handled climate change and we'll learn from that. And that will give us tools to face our contemporary uh, issues today. Um, uh, absolutely, a really a, a worthwhile project, and not the one I'm going to argue uh, that, that I'm seeking to pursue here today. We have people who are working uh, particularly within anarchist approaches that are particularly uh, in, important. I'm thinking about groups like the Black Trowel Collective here and others who have written about how anarchism can offer us political models from the past that are different to the ones we have today and might be able to be employed in the present. One can think of uh, David Wengro and David Graeber's uh, work here, which of course employs anarchism at the largest scale to think these things through. There are pragmatist archaeologists who are asking direct questions about the difference archaeology makes. There are archaeologists often from a Marxist background working within social activism. And there are contemporary archaeologists who are using the techniques of archaeology to understand the present day. All of these are important, all of these are relevant, and I am not in the business of, of doing down any of them. But I want to suggest that archaeology, and specifically archaeological theory, also has a role to play in this process. Not instead of any of these, but alongside them as a specific tool that we can draw on to help imagine these other worlds that might make a different future possible for us. And we might think of this, uh, um, it's all the experiments we're calling it here, archaeology in a future tense. One of the definitions I'm trying to offer for archaeology elsewhere in my work is that it's the act of assembling past worlds in the present. It takes place in the here and now. And the act of assembling those past worlds, I think, is a powerful act of imagination. It's a way of imagining a world where things don't operate in the way that they do today. And one of the crucial tools of archaeological theory is to unpick those bits of the past worlds that we imagine that end up somehow looking the same as our current world. And this is what theory has done repeatedly through time. Uh, feminist approaches most powerfully in the early 1980s, flagging how 
power was implicitly gendered as male all the way through uh, processual writings, for example. So archaeological theory allows us to challenge the kind of um, how particular kinds of figures, for example, the chief, the warrior, the smith play a role, particularly in places like the European Bronze Age, but end up looking really quite familiar when uh, certain Bronze Age archaeologists write about uh, warriors and chiefs. You kind of imagine they're almost looking a little bit in the mirror and seeing themselves. Going, if I was in the Bronze Age, I, I'd probably have been a chief or maybe a warrior or something like that. I think that's what it was like. And I think that the beauty of archaeological theory is to try and unpick that and to open up other ways of imagining past worlds, to give us tools for thinking them through. And because I think imagining a future world is such a critical part of giving us the wherewithal to survive and to face up to our contemporary challenges, I think that's not, that's not a small thing. It's the first step to really begin to face up to contemporary challenges. Now, I've said this once already, I'm gonna say it again. I'm not claiming that archeological theory is gonna save the world. Um, that's not the argument I'm making here. All I'm arguing is that thinking differently is actually a non-trivial step in dealing with these contemporary challenges. It's actually the ground upon which we have to move if we want to face these challenges, that waiting for science or saviors or whoever else to come out of nowhere to deal with these problems will not be enough. The first thing we have to do is imagine a different world. And the archaeology and archaeological theory is actually extremely well placed to help us do that. And again, I want to stress I'm not necessarily talking about a particular brand here of archaeological theory, if you like. I'm talking about the act of conceptualizing these past worlds. So I want to finish off with three quick examples of this, of how this might work, and then I'm going to conclude. So firstly, I think archaeology can help us imagine leadership really differently. I think the way we approach leadership in our contemporary political uh, climate is pretty impoverished. We seem to move from one archetypal male leader to another. And famously, when we do have other people coming into those roles, they often form up to or act out those roles, even if they themselves aren't male, for example. Margaret Thatcher would be a good example of that. And this has a kind of, I think, a corrosive recursive effect with many of the ways we've written about leadership in the past, where implicitly male figures who are overly familiar to us emerge as the people um, who are in charge of building monuments or who have the most grave goods or who are in, become the warrior chiefs of the Bronze Age or whatever else it might be. But I think archaeological theory can provoke us to think really quite differently about that. We can imagine different kinds of gendered leadership. We can imagine leadership that isn't so much about an alpha male dominating the room as it is about projects being constructed, people being brought into projects that create collective strengths and collective leadership. And the other thing archaeology could do then is perhaps offer something even more radical. What about the role of non-human leaders? What happens if we were to imagine leadership in the past as being located in a, um, in a monolith at Tiwanaku, or we were to imagine it located in a knife dagger from a Bronze Age burial, or in a monument having power in itself, not as a metaphor, not as a reflection of the beliefs of people at the time, but in a literal sense. If we can reimagine leadership in really radical manners in the past, can we offer models for what a radical leadership might look like in the present? What would it mean to accord leadership to rivers or mountains or other forms of non-human matter in our world today in terms of how we respond to climate crisis? A second example, truth. If you uh, go anywhere, we're beset with the rise of fake news. You can't trust what you read on the internet. People are spouting nonsense. Elon Musk is destroying whatever Twitter is called now, X and all these sorts of things. Donald Trump says what he likes. It's terrible. We've lost all our sense of objectivity. So this crisis in truth and reliability is clearly really central to our contemporary political world. And one response to that has been to a call for a return to objective facts. We just need to agree objective facts that are true, and then we'll be able to rely on them all the way through. I'm not sure that actually has proven very helpful. I think for one sense, objectivity has been shown by feminist scholars and indigenous scholars to be not very neutral or indeed objective in itself. But also if objectivity was so good, how did it get undermined quite so quickly? I wonder if there are elements of archeology span that might actually provide a different way of thinking about truth. Think about what happens if you try and set a skeleton on a site 
Uh, this is um, uh, a skeleton uh, on my colleague Rachel Crellin's dig on the Isle of Man, uh, or the really the jet beetle with a skeleton. That's Emily Banfield, who works for Cambridge Archaeological Unit, drawing from there, my former PhD student. With a, often when we work with sexing archaeological remains, it requires all sorts of different lines of evidence to come together. And if we move from the sort of from sex to gender, that requires even more things coming together. ADNA itself, particularly if your skeleton doesn't survive particularly well like this one does, it won't give you a singular neat answer to the gender of past people. But that doesn't mean either that we're just making it up as we go along as archaeologists. All the time, we're bringing together multiple lines of evidence to build up really robust and coherent narratives about past worlds. You've probably, I've certainly had this loads of times about as an archaeologist from anthropologists and historians go, how do you really know though? Because I read, you know, I'm a historian, I read it in a book, or I'm an anthropologist and I asked somebody, how do you as an archaeologist, you've got no one to talk to, and if you work in prehistory, well, I think we know because we build up multiple lines of evidence that support each other, and we do so in complex, interesting ways. And that actually, that response to truth that doesn't rest simply on objective fact, but on multiple lines of evidence coming together, might be a much more robust way of dealing with the rise of fake news in the contemporary world than simply calling for return to a kind of lost objectivity, or can't we all just agree about everything? And finally, then, what about the Anthropocene itself and climate crisis and all these sorts of things? It seems almost impossible at the moment for us to break away from the inevitability of climate crisis, the inevitability of sea level rise, the ine inevitability of a world riven by extreme climate crisis caused by the rise of global temperatures. But obsessing over that kind of inevitability seems to kind of universalize what actually is a quite particular and historically varied experience. Catherine Yusuf's absolutely brilliant book, A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None, which I would highly recommend if you haven't read it, shows this up really nicely, how the concept of the Anthropocene itself does a kind of violence to the um, variety of ways in which it's experienced and to the diversity of suffering that responds to the Anthropocene. I think archaeologists can come in here and offer really interesting accounts of how we can conceptualize waste and climates and bodies and experiences that might offer very different ways of thinking about the transformations that we're going to in historically nuanced and specific ways and might open up the possibility of changing that future and dealing with it differently from the world we've experienced so far. I think doing so is going to take not only engaged archaeology with people we live with, but also theoretically informed archaeology to approach these in different kinds of ways, to think them through in different kinds of ways, to explore them in different kinds of ways. This is a conversation archaeology can be really well suited to contributing to, to help imagine the different kinds of Anthropocene that might happen, the different kinds of climate crisis, to imagine different ways of responding to it that might give us something we can actually concretely do, rather than simply continually allowing this process to happen to us. Now, I've glossed over quite a lot in that last part of the talk, and I know you're thinking to yourself, I wish I could read more about those kind of issues and how archaeology can contribute to contemporary issues today. And you're probably also thinking to yourself, Christmas is coming up. I don't know what to ask for, and I don't know what to buy my parents, my friends, my lecturers, everybody I know. But don't worry, I can assure you the answers are out next week. So... Uh, <laughs> That's, yeah, that's my plug done. I, I managed to save it till the last slide. So these are topics that my uh, friends and colleagues, uh, former colleague Craig Spolder and my current colleague Rachel Krellin and I have explored in quite a lot of detail in our book that is coming out uh, a, next, a week today on Monday. So what I've tried to argue today then is that archaeological theory remains intensely relevant to the worlds that we live in. It makes it relevant to us as archaeologists because it allows us to ask new questions of the past. Asking new questions helps us generate new answers, and it helps to create worlds that are less familiar to us than the world of the present. And that act of creating a world that's different, of assembling a past world that is not the same, is really, really important, because those acts of imagination allow us to think about how we can create worlds of the future. 
It's not that archaeology itself is the solution to the world's uh, problems, let alone archaeological theory, but it's also not the case that what we do is somehow cut off from the world, isolated in an ivory tower, or simply the indulgences of people fortunate enough to have the time and the money to carry it out. Archaeology offers us an intense set of intellectual tools that if we take advantage of it, can help transform how we think about the past, transform how we think about the present, and offer models for different kinds of futures. And that's why I think archaeology, theory, archaeology and archaeological theory matter for today and tomorrow. Thanks very much indeed. Just to preempt the obvious first question, Amazon, uh, Routledge's website, is any anywhere, any good booksellers? In the booksellers, yeah, all, all available. Website, which I would have liked Christmas. Yeah, absolutely. Please go ahead. Pre delivery on Tuesday Oh, there you go. So order now. So don't be disappointed. Who knows what the print run is? It could easily be gone by Christmas. <laughs> But can I ask, if I were a social anthropologist, I would say, well, I can do this rather better. And I might just throw up. Sure. I don't, I don't want to, um, I, 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 I don't. The third, the, you know, the third issue. Yeah. I think the, the question there, I think, is particularly about the way archaeology can help us think about the material elements mm -hmm. of that. So it's not, I don't want to introduce any other discipline or say they can't contribute to it. It's not like this is better than that. But I do think there are specific ways in which archaeology can offer other kinds of engagement that don't tend to come through um, social anthropology. And particularly that's about materials and the role of materials in human lives. And it seems to me in our contemporary world, that's particularly pressing because it's both our uh, reliance on material things and our entanglement, in a, to use Hodder's term, with material things that has entrapped us into a set of relationships we can't seem to break free of. So thinking about other ways of talking about human material relationships, and I think that really requires us to embrace the power of material things, because as long as we have the image that material things are just doing what we tell them to, it's actually very that that idea is what has that hasn't thinking that hasn't changed our relationship with material things at all. We actually rely on cars and planes, even though we know they're killing us. In one, I mean, cars are literally, you know, in the sense both they run us over and they're producing pollutants that are killing people in large numbers. You can see the deaths in town centres around air pollution. Right, this is happening across the world. So where I think archaeology can really offer is, is offering models for rethinking human thing relationships, where we embrace the power of non-humans, the role they play in constructing material worlds that operate, because if we don't do that, we can't imagine a world differently. And I think that's where the ease with which disciplines like social anthropology will, will talk about the human element of it because they have access to it. And it's not that social anthropologists don't talk about material things, of course they do, but I think archaeology can contribute something, but because of the way we are forced to interrogate that relationship specifically. And that's where, again, I'm not trying to argue that archaeology is the answer, but it's about what can archaeology contribute to this. And I think in that direction, we really do have something to offer, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good Thanks. Thank you, so, um, so I want to ask something, but so do you think that maybe then, um, Archaeology is then almost archaeology in the reverse, like ethnoarchaeology. So that instead of um, being like ethnographic archaeology, we look at the geography of maybe a foreign um, society or culture to the past, whereas archaeology actually might have potential to offer various explanations for how things might be today. Yeah, that's a really, I hadn't thought about it in those terms, but that's a really interesting way of thinking about it. I think one of the, I think archaeology has been obsessed for far too long about its evidential deficits, right? And we've sought lots of ways to kind of overcome that. 
you know, oh, if only we had people to talk to or we had a historical text to read, we'd be much more secure in, in what we can say about the past, right? And that's one of the reasons why things like ethnographic analogy or ethnoarchaeology have kind of taken off as ways to bridge a middle range theory in the terms that Binford would have used to bridge the kind of st apparently static past that we encounter and the actual dynamics we knew were out there. And I think actually we, we've we've been far too reticent and embracing how that evidential gap allows us to be really creative, not in the sense of making it up, right? Because that's the thing I was trying to say about truth is actually I think what we become really good at is building narratives that are really reliable in the face of that evidential gap. And I think that's what allows us then to kind of be think about how we could use that and embrace that creativity much more. So that might be about thinking about how the current world we have has emerged through different trajectories. It might also be about how can how can we change our current sets of relationships with material things now? And what does that mean for the future? And what would it require to do that? And one of the things it might require is imagining the role of those material things differently in our lives, both things that we're that are being damaged, like what we might think as the natural environment, but if, so that's problematic, but also the things that are doing the damaging, whether that's playing or cars or extracting hydrocarbons or whatever it might be. So I think, yeah, I think there's, I think there's all sorts of ways in which we haven't embraced what archaeology can do for the present, in part because we've been very caught up in worrying that we're not really confident enough in ourselves about what we say about the past. And that lack of certainty has been treated much more negatively rather than as a creative invitation to, to be to embrace what that can do for us. Um, uh, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, I don't know if you disagree, but I think a lot of the general public, even though there are being all these new ideas in archaeology, a lot of the general public still have an idea of the past that is based on archaeological theory from, I don't know, 30, 40 plus years ago. Um, so in terms of how archaeology can help face contemporary issues, as you were mentioning, what's the best way to get those ideas out of the universities and into the popular consciousness? Uh, that's, yeah, that's a really good question. So one of uh, our PhD students at the University of Leicester, Brody Malloy, is doing a project around homelessness. And so what she's doing, and, and this is like a case study of what you might want to do, for example, she's doing work with schools where she's taking ideas about um, homelessness and unhomed people in the past and the present, and actually using elements of quite complicated nomadic, as in Rosie Brodotti's nomadic theory, to think that through. And they're going out and working with people in schools to help them think differently about homelessness in the past and the present. So her work is trying by directly working with young people. And obviously she's not handing out copies of Rosie Bredotti for the 15 year olds to read in class, right? She's find, directly finding workshops that allow her to explore how we might think differently around homelessness as a contemporary issue by thinking about the past differently and about thinking about our relationships with home differently. So in one sense, that's quite small scale. Obviously that's not gonna change government policy overnight. Um, but that's an example of how that can be kind of put into practice. And I think Brody's work is a really excellent example of that. More generally, I think that, that what you're identifying is one of the toughest challenges in terms of that all of the changes we have in arch archaeological thought don't really resonate with the public. And that's not helped by the fact that when archaeological discoveries hit on things that do resonate with the public, they often fit, they are directly related. So the ancient DNA stuff flies out and is in every newspaper and is re re really easily embraced about how there was a big population replacement. Or, you know, I didn't talk about it, but the idea that the, the people in Newgrange were uh, inbreeding god kings is like that is really pop consumed in a kind of a popularist manner, right? Whereas actually, they're really interesting ways of thinking about the evidence for incest at Newgrange. And I think god kings is probably the least interesting possible explanation one could come up with for that. Um, and including that includes thinking around issues like abuse and domestic violence. And Mariana's work has touched on this a lot, right? We don't talk about that in the past very much. And how do we do that in different ways that open up how we think about these things? So Brody's work, I think, is a small scale example of that. And I don't have a kind of neat example for how we do that more generally. But you're absolutely right to identify that as a kind of critical challenge, definitely. Yeah. And obviously the actual answer is by buying all of your friends a copy of Archaeology Today and Tomorrow and giving it to them for Christmas is what I should have said. <laughs>
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I have two questions, but one was asked very eloquently by Mr. And the second question, I guess, and you know, not new to all of you, but I really, I do really enjoy the idea of thinking about the past as a space of a kind of radical imagination of other worlds. Um, but as you know, for the Vikings in particular, I've argued that you can make space for the non-human, you can recognize patterns where non-human beings play really important parts in things like leadership, for instance, uh -huh. and yet it falls down uh, into a system that is uh, disappointingly familiar when it comes to things like gender politics or oppression or enslavement. Uh -huh. of people. And so you have a world that is absolutely different and other, any materialism or other relational approaches can help us see that and ask radical new questions. But still, there are stories that are full of oppression and violence and abuse. And so, uh, if we're thinking with the recent reality and we want to be affirmative, um, does that help us thinking about the future? Yeah, I think there's a critical dis distinction between affirmative and utopian in that context. And you're absolutely right that the past here. I don't think it does any favours to utopianize. Is that a verb? It is now. The past. Um, and to pretend that the past was a wonderful place, free of violence, free of abuse, free of any of those, free of binary gender systems, whatever else you might want to, uh, whatever you might want to resist in the present, right? It isn't about, I think, that kind of, I think it's not about the model in that direct way, you know, in the sense, let's organize our social relations like the Vikings, then we'll all be fine. That's probably not something that you would recommend. Um, uh, it sounds quite exciting to me. It doesn't really. Um, but, you know, that's a kind of, you know, absolutely not. I think it's the, po the possibility of the difference itself is what is affirmative, though. It's the encounter with difference that creates the possibility for thinking differently. And that's what's really critical, is that so much of what we've done you know, if the Viking example is an interesting one. Like if you think about slave, the way slavery is written about, and I'm, you are massively more of an expert on this than me, so feel free to, I'm hopefully not mansplaining to you, but talking to the audience, and please tell me where I'm wrong. You know, one of the things that happens with a concept like slavery is it can be quite essentialized, and slavery operates in the same way in the Viking world as it does in um, pre-Civil War North America, for example, or in the Roman world, or whatever. And the actually, we know those differences are actually quite profound between how those different worlds work and the different way they operate in those kinds of worlds. And we can take other concepts and explore those differences similarly. And it's not that we should lift up any of those models and employ them in the present. So let's, I mean, one can disagree about the role of, I've argued that monuments were leaders in the Olympic Britain in a non-metaphorical sense, right? That isn't an argument that in the present, we should treat any monument you name in the UK today as a leader directly in that way. It's about creating a space for imagination in the present where we explore the possibilities of a world where leadership takes up really different kinds of forms. Some worlds will lend some tools for thinking in that way better than others. And particularly, no world offers a kind of utopian solution I'm suggesting we pick up and try and institute in the present. I think too often that's the kind of learning from the past model, if you like. Oh, um, the Neolithic was a time of, uh, was a matriarchal, the Gimbutas model of the Neolithic as a matriarchal society. We should return to that. That was peaceful until those horrid Bronze Age Kurgans came and swept everybody away. I mean, effectively, the argument both of Maria Gimbutas and of contemporary ADNA scholars. But I, I'm not arguing that that's not a, that's not what I'm trying to argue. That's the kind of, where the past merely becomes a kind of mirror for the present. It's not really responding to the difference productively. So I think with the Vikings, for example, one might think about the role of non-humans in leadership as a productive tool for thinking with, not to institute swords or boats or any other powerful non-human in the Viking age as leaders today, but rather to reconceptualize what the boundaries of that concept can do and to create cracks and fissures in what seems to me to be really tightly sealed conceptual boundaries around who is a human, who has power, who has agency, who's allowed to speak and who has to remain silent. And the more we can create cracks in those concepts, we can find our way to other kinds of places. And it's that tool of the past as a crack creator, I'm going to say, that's a bad term. Concept, uh, the, it's a, the past helps us create concepts that creates fissures in our own ways of of our own images of thought. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think it can do for us, if that makes sense. And I wonder if that ties to the question about public engagement as well. So as you know, but 
I and others, uh, are trying to create disruptive and different narratives of theory and stars that in very conventional terms and also disseminate that to the public. And that is perhaps a kind of small scale critical thinking that you're uh, asking our technology to do. Yeah, a a absolutely. And I think that, I think the first step is making fishes in your own thinking and on our thinking collectively as a discipline the next step is finding ways of making those cracks and fishes in other people and they probably i don't think that the methodology for doing that will be the same at all but the i think the results are the same sorts of things they're about what if make those spaces make those cracks make those ways in that open up other kinds of ways of thinking about the past to help us reimagine the future I'll just end, yeah. yeah. That's okay. Do I need to stop recording first, do you think? Uh, yeah, probably. I'll just stop anyway. <laughs>